what happens when money enters the domain of life and pricing life, as I did in my early uh, dissertation first uh, book. Hi, this is Dr. Jed McCosco at Wake Forest University and Academic Influence. And today we have with us Viviana Salazar, who is at Princeton University in the sociology department. Now we've interviewed people in a lot of the different humanities. So the first question I have is, what makes sociology different from let's say anthropology? Um, and what are some of the, the things that set it apart? Well, there are a lot of parallels between both fields in the sense that they're both trying to understand social life and in that sense a contrast with psychology which of course they're interested in social life but the focus is on the individual individual development individual cognition and the both sociologists and anthropologists are more interested in the social relations even though there are many uh, splendid uh, scholars in both of those fields that may specialize in cognitive aspects of social relationships and uh, you know i would say that in the past the boundaries between sociology and anthropology were stronger in the sense that anthropologists would study primitive communities and uh, other you know uh, other kinds of um, um, groups and less contemporary capitalist societies but but in the past years anthropologists have done splendid ethnographies and studies of contemporary societies, uh, you know, I I I have been interested in the work uh, the work of early anthropologists because I've I've been very interested in the sociology of money, and uh, in early anthropol and early anthropologists and many you know brilliant anthropologists have studied the differentiations of monies in primitive societies, meaning that they had different forms of money for different kinds of relations or activities. And the supposition was for a long time that uh, in contemporary capitalist societies, money was money, a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. So all those differences, primitive differences had disappeared. And what I have been showing in my work since uh, early, since the, you know, my, especially a book on the social meaning of money, is how we still mark very powerful distinctions among categories of money, what I call the earmarking of money. So that in many households, the wife's money has been differentiated from the husband's money, from the child's money. So we may not have maybe physical differentiations, although those also exist, but we make other differentiations. So, and many anthropologists also began studying these differentiations in, in, in capitalist society. So again, we joined more the fields, I would say, in, in these latter decades than before. That's fascinating. Well, it definitely seems like money has been one of the contributions you've made, stud studying the sociology of money. Um, how does your contribution and, and the things that have made you very influential in sociology uh, fit in with some of the people that you see as also being very influential in sociology. We Obviously, we interviewed Omar um, Lazardo, and he's used a lot of big data, uh, for example, in Spain, to look at different sociology um, factors. But, but how does your research fit in with some of the other great sociologists of our modern era? You know, I, 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 it's a it's it's great question. Omar Lizardo is a is a brilliant uh, uh, younger generation uh, sociologist. Have done work in culture and in in many uh, domains. I, I I much admire him, and I used a different methodology because I was trained uh, as a social historian and I was trained as a sociologist, but I had this, this grant that trained me in, in the methods of social history. I have used documentary analysis, meaning I have used archival sources. So in a way, why am I different from a regular historian? I, you, 
which is another uh, another kind of boundary is and again the boundaries there are flexible but i am more interested in exploring a general question like how what happens when money enters the domain of life and pricing life as i did in my early uh, dissertation first uh, book and i use the historical documents to try to identify or find answers uh, to 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 that to that question you know for example in a book on the value changing value of children i was interested again in the question is how, how can we put a price on children's life and one of the topics that i studied was the changing market for adoption and foster care of children so that for example at the turn of the 20th century it's the first time that you have the emergence of a baby market before you know people when they adopt well there was adoption took a while but when they took in foster kids it was mostly older kids who could work and uh, and it was very hard to place a, a baby so but turn of the century i started to do again uh, archival using i use many different kinds of sources uh, I, 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 you know, from legal cases, but also I use even novels. Uh, I use um, government documents, uh, but I, I do what is called a qualitative examination of those documents rather than count them. And you know, so it's a different approach. And as I again, as I tell you know my students, all you know, the. The, the key is having an interesting question, and then you find which method adapts better to answering that question. That's great advice, because sometimes when you have a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. And if you have big data, you just feel like you really? have to analyze it, uh, and that can become a trap. Absolutely. And, I, and, I, and I'm, you know what I mean? I'm not like uh, uh, saying, you know, big data is great stuff. And, and however, it is, you have to know for which questions you want to use your, the, the, the big data. And I, you know, I watch with admiration the new methodologies emerging. And, but again, uh, when I have a graduate student that is deciding on the methodologies, I tell them, you know, well, what, what will answer your question better? It's good advice. Really good. Well, what do you think the future lies for? Uh, studying the interaction of humans with their money as we go to PayPal and Venmo and Bitcoin. And do you, do you look forward at all, uh, you know, I mean, looking into the future or do you, because you're more of a historical document uh, person who analyzes that stuff, is it all of your work in the past? No, I actually am very interested in the future and I'm delighted because there's a series of young scholars who are in fact producing fascinating work on the new monies that, that are emerging or, you know, there's two domains. One is the actual new monies that are emerging, like the cryptocurrencies and, and these new Venmo as a system of payment, uh, all these exciting new methods of payment. But there's also ways of looking how new relationships uh, uh, are, are, uh, that are emerging are shaped by money. Even the topic of influencers it's, it's, and young kids who are influencers, how are they Paid and you know how do the parents manage that money? All these new questions that are emerging, you know, I, I do find. And in fact, my uh, um, latest uh, uh, project has been for the for several years now in collaboration with a former student who's actually a demographer, Lauren Gaydash. We've been studying undergraduates' management of cross class relations in. A, 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 you know, we're looking. We're in, we have interviewed uh, students at Princeton. Uh, how do they manage cross-class relations in in terms of their economic transactions? You know how you know uh, uh, colleges and especially uh, Ivy League colleges uh, offer a kind of laboratory in cross-class relations because you may have a, a, a student from a 
you know, very uh, upper class family, very affluent, may be rooming in their first year with somebody who is on full financial aid. So, you know, how do you negotiate uh, the expenses uh, and all this? So, so, and that's, you know, this study has meant that for the first time in my academic life, at this late stage, I have had uh, first time that I interviewed live respondents. All my respondents were in dead documents, right? So it's been very, uh, very exciting. And at the same time, very challenging to report on the words of students that I met. You know, I, I, you know I've been always very respectful of my dead respondents and these documents from the early 20th century, but it's, it's different. I'm sure to, it is. To, well, we're dying to know. Yeah. What have you, what have you found out about the, well, no, you know, I'm, 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 we're working on the, that, well, we find out that students engage in what we call relational work, which means trying to find ways to match these relationships and roommates and in ways that don't, you know, that are not disrupted by the fact that their finances are, are different. We, we did, we have a small uh, publication in the Princeton Alumni Weekly of uh, early 2019, but maybe I'll, I'll return and tell you more when we have a, a more answers. But it's, it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's part of what is happening in uh, many schools, obviously, not, not just Ivy League schools. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your research, a little bit about how your field has evolved and the boundaries, the very flexible boundaries between some of the other humanities that we've featured on this show. So thank you so much for taking the time with us today, Viviana. It was truly a pleasure to get to meet you. Thank you. My pleasure too.